Earl Labor, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Brett. So you have a new memoir out, and it's about a, a specific period in your life in history. It's the years 1945 through 1950, and you call this period the era of bright expectations. Why is that? Uh, I'll tell you, Brett, this is an amazing um, phenomenon in that uh, this particular era between the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Korean War was absolutely distinct, unique, but it's been neglected. Unlike the 20s and what have you, there was a terrific kind of optimism. I call it a bubble of euphoria during this period because we had we just uh, gone through the worst depression in American history and gone through the most horrendous war in uh, world history. We had won that war and emerged as the most powerful nation in the world. And we were ready to <laughs> meet any kind of challenge, and there was a kind of optimism there that was never there before, and I'm afraid hasn't been there since. And I wanted in the book for our readers to understand the uh, distinction or the wonderful uh, uniqueness of that uh, particular five years. You were too young to fight in World War II. Did you ever feel like you missed out on taking part in it? I, yes and no. When the war began, like uh, most other young guys at the time, I was chomping at the bit to get in. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. If I'd been a year older, I might, as I say in the book, I might not be here to talk now or I might not have been able to to write the book because it might be dead. As the war went on, especially later, I think my enthusiasm uh, waned a bit. For example, one of my best friends, L.B. Broach, was just, I guess, a, less than a year older, and uh, he went into the Army in the uh, late summer or fall, or early fall of 1944, and uh, hadn't been in there six months when he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. So I'm just saying that I sort of have mixed feelings about uh, about getting in there to, to the fight. So you attended SMU during this time. What was SMU like after World War II? Well, it was no longer, at least for a few years, there was no longer the uh, Country Club of the South, which it had been, and I don't know if it has that reputation now. I think it's got a terrific reputation. I'm proud of my alma mater. But during that period with all the veterans coming back on the GI Bill, uh, the atmosphere was, was quite different now. I've got to say that our culture, of course, was very different then than it is now. There was more of a sense of unity and a sense, as I said earlier, of optimism. Our professors, as far as I had any idea, were not politicized. I mean, I never got a sense that they were a member of one particular party or another. And the students, I think, were not as politicized as they are today. In fact, most of us, especially the veterans, I say, were more interested in learning how to improve their lives through uh, college education. I don't remember anybody wanting to protest at the time. And it was just, I've got to say, I consider it a more wholesome situation, uh, maybe even saner than uh, than I notice out there today. You're a college professor. That's what you did. Did you notice, do you notice a big difference between students today besides the wanting to protest the politicization? Is there a difference between students today and the ones you saw in the 1940s? I've noticed a number of differences, uh, Brett, in terms of the attitude. And as I say, uh, there was not the kind of this unity we see, not the kind of protesting, taking political sides or what have you. Even the curriculum was very different back in those days. We were still studying the classics like Shakespeare and, and even the Roman and Greek classics, what have you, instead of trying to uh, be more politically correct or whatever. And I think uh, the students back then, once again, were we're more, uh, in one sense, I guess, patriotic, <laughs> maybe even more conservative or what have you, uh, less inclined to, to raise hell than they became later on. 
So your memoir is called The Far Music. Uh, what's that reference to? Let me take a little time for this one, Brett. The idea of, of escaping, uh, going back to nature, hitting the road and what have you, uh, getting away from all the pressures of society, that essentially was my idea. Wanted to get up to the uh, Canadian wilderness, work our way up on the road to get to the Canadian wilderness, go out there and build a cabin and spend a year away from society and all the pressures that are put on you by society. The uh, title of the book, though, the idea of writing a book about it was my buddy Pink Lindsay's. He was a uh, World War II veteran. He was only a couple of years older than I, but he seemed much older because of what he had been through in the war. He was like a big brother, almost like a father figure to me, and he was uh, physically the strongest man I'd ever met at the time. And we bonded. Uh, both of us were weightlifters, and uh, that's where I first met him, up at the uh, gym and at SMU working out with the weights. We bonded almost immediately. He's just a good old boy from P.B. Lindsay from Gilmer, Texas. And I, my home was Pittsburgh, Texas at the time, about 20 miles from there. Anyhow, back to Pink, he'd come to uh, SMU on the GI Bill uh, to be a pre-med, become a doctor. But he took a course under a Professor George Bond on the American novel and read Jack London's Martin Eden. As a result of that, he decided he wanted to become an English major and become a, a professional writer. And uh, what he did before he died, uh, he he wrote several pages of, of a manuscript called The Far Music. That was his term. And uh, I... Uh, I got to credit him with the idea of the book. He, he was essentially a poet, I think. I'm reading and, and short, uh, giving you a shortened version of some of this uh, that he uh, left behind in a manuscript that he left for me. He said uh, about the far music, it is the music of the spirit and the heart and the soul that lies deep within us the sleeping beauty that dwells below the surface of mean experience. Perhaps it is. it can only be heard when we are very young. Because I was then young and had known no great and abiding sorrow in spite of the indescribable and unthinkable things I had witnessed in the war, I felt optimistic about my search for the days of my life were new and the machine, which was my body, was new and sinew and blood and bone work together in that admirable way so peculiar to early years. It is a cry from beyond the horizon, and like the horizon would by necessity recede from me as I pressed forever toward it. I love that section from his manuscript, and as I say, that's uh, the best description I can think of what we meant by the far music. I love that. You said you had this idea to go up to Canada. Was there something that inspired that adventure, or was there someone, an author? What What was the inspiration behind the adventure? Well, I think both of us were tired of book work by the time we graduated in 1949. We'd been pretty steady at the books for four years there and wanted to get away from not only the books, but also uh, the other pressures of society. Uh, in fact, both of us had had some some uh, fairly uh, passionate love affairs. In my case, uh, I'd gone with this lovely young woman for three years, and everybody expected us to get married, and so did I. But as we got closer to the to the date of graduation, I began to think, look, I'm not ready for the responsibilities that come with marriage and family. And Pink, on the other hand, had had a pretty passionate uh, affair with a, a young woman who was uh, older than most of the SMU students, and uh, that had kind of burned itself out. I think both of us were ready to hit the road and and have a different kind of romance, if you'll accept that term. 
what was the original idea of your adventure? Was it, it was to get to Canada, but you had to work your way up there. So what was, that's right. What was the plan? We thought originally we might follow the wheat harvest up there, but the wheat harvest was delayed by a couple of weeks by rain uh, that summer. So we started working in grain elevators uh, throughout uh, Kansas and, and uh, that was uh, the main source of our of our uh, income uh, for most of the summer until we settled down in Kansas City later on around the first of, of September or so. We we worked on let's see grain out ele- building grain ele- elevators in uh, Mead, Kansas, and Wichita, and finally in Hutchinson, which was. Uh, Supposed to be the largest grain elevator ever built up there. And what was that work like? Was it back backbreaking labor? <laughs> well, it was warm. It was hot out there, and I can remember the first day out working at Mead. We hadn't prepared much in, in the way of sandwiches. I think peanut butter sandwich, and maybe uh, that was about peanut butter and jelly. And uh, our job was digging a ditch out there. We had the the elevator there in Mead was almost finished, and we had to dig a ditch for the electrical connections up to the main the head house, as they called it, the main part of the elevator. And I can remember ordinarily, you know, a young man will fantasize about sports and maybe about girls and what have you. But I remember I had a different kind of fantasy that day because I was so hungry and hot out there. My uncle Glenn had been taking me once a week when I was in college to this uh, cafeteria close to campus in Dallas. And so all day long out digging that ditch, I was going through the line in my fantasy, uh, uh, getting all these salads and and, uh, other uh, desserts and what have you all day long while I was digging the ditch. (laughs) Pink had a a different story about he described the shovel in different terms. He says, I believe that in the final tally, a reckoning would be uh, that with the slow and subtle attrition of time, the pen shall be mightier than the uh, sword. But of one thing I'm fairly certain, the shovel is mightier than both. And he talks about being out there so hot and working on this ditch. I don't see how God ever created the universe out of nothing, for we as his creatures are not capable of building anything without first digging a ditch. He says a draft of wind that suddenly sprang sprang up at mid-morning across the Kansas plain was cool, surprising enough, and was our salvation. I thought of all things significant, the clashing of worlds in the far space, the haunting melodies of Tannhauser, Tannhauser, the magnificence of Beethoven's Ninth, the bursting seeds of life, the cold inexorableness of death, the ever-moving globe, time and space, and somehow failed to reckon by what manipulation of all things natural and unnatural I've been coerced into being at this spot at this time. Uh... I'm sure there must be some great moral attached to all this. Uh, But as my breakfast played out at about 11 o'clock, I I felt an even deeper ache that there was some great moral to all this. But I'll be a son of a bitch if I know what it is. (laughs) Yeah, I had to share that with you, whether or not you got time for it or not. But anyhow, let's move along here as best we can. So how did you travel from job to job. You didn't have a car that first part of your trip, correct? At at first, we were hitchhiking, which was no big problem back in those days. I wouldn't wouldn't advise it today because of all the craziness out there. But we, uh, for the first uh, several weeks, we were on the road hitchhiking. Then we got enough money to come back to Texas and uh, get a used car. We bought, uh, let's say, Pink's uncle, Hiram, Lindsay owned a uh, used car uh, dealership in Gilmer, Texas, and he took us down to Longview for a dealer's auction. We bought a little 1940 Ford for $400, and that was our transportation almost to the very end there. 
And where did where did you sleep? Like what what did you do for lodging? Uh, let's see. The most common way of sleeping was in the car. Either the front, we'd switch back and forth between the front seat and the back seat. Uh, the back seat was more comfortable. It was a sedan, as I should have pointed out. Anyhow, as we were on the road, if if we spotted a a haystack, I preferred that. Pink, having grown up on the farm, knew about snakes. <laughs> In haystacks, but I wasn't that I wasn't that worried about them. If there was a snake in one of the haystacks I slept in, we didn't bother each other. There was a period when we were working at the uh, grain elevator in Hudson, Kansas, before both of us could get a room at the Y. Pink managed to get in, but they they were short of rooms. And for a week out there, I slept out, out outside town in the woods. And I, there was one memorable experience I'll share with you. I, I, we worked from 7 at night to 7 in the morning on that grain elevator. We'd come back in, and I'd get some breakfast, and I'd uh, walk on out or trot on out the edge of town out to the woods and find a place that was comfortable under the trees out there. And I'm, I'd sleep from about oh, 9 in the morning to about 3 in the afternoon, something of that sort. One afternoon... I was asleep, and I heard this voice in the distance, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And as it came near, it was, some kid was yelling, Hey, Charlie, hey, Charlie, come over here. I see a dead man over here. And I thought, well, I better let those kids know that I'm I'm alive. I raised up, and I, they were about, what, 50 yards away or so. About, I'm guessing about 10 years old out exploring the woods. I raised up, and as 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 I did that, the one in the lead says, oh, don't bother, he ain't dead after all. He was disappointed <laughs> that the corpse had some life in it. Anyhow, that's, I guess that's enough about sleeping. There was one time we slept in oak fields out in uh, South Dakota, but mainly it was the car. So besides the grain elevators, you spent some time working at an alfalfa mill and can you tell us a little bit about that oh the alfalfa mill i think uh, i'm gonna hold on just a minute i i think that was uh i'm gonna paraphrase charles dickens here it was the best of jobs it was the worst of jobs bread i'm i mean the best and it was the worst it's certainly the most memorable the worst meaning it was the unhealthiest. I, I point out in the book that it was unhealthier than working in the heat, stringing barbed wire fences in East Texas and baling hay, plowing wheat fields in Oklahoma, or trimming hams for Armour's meat packing plant in Kansas City. Even hell, it was unhealthier, I, I, I think, if less dangerous than what I'd done working on a maintenance crew for Lone Star Steel Company, not to mention the work we had uh, uh, done on the grain elevators. But it was something very special. Uh, I've got to point out these alfalfa mills are not the same today as they were back uh, 70 years ago. This was out. This one out uh, about seven miles west of Larned, Kansas, was... Uh, a mill where they bring in the cut alfalfa. They bring in the they harvested alfalfa in trucks from the fields, and they dump it into the top of this building they've got there, this structure where it's chopped up and dried, and it comes down through pipes down to the floor that are bifurcated. And here's what we encountered. On the floor that we worked down at the bottom, each of these three major funnels or pipes uh, with the chopped and dried alfalfa, which was intended for as stock feed, by the way. Each was bifurcated, and there were a lot of gunny sacks. You put a gunny sack on, one of those on one opening there, and you, you fill up that gunny sack to approximately 100 pounds, and then you flip over the lever to another gunny sack while you take this one that's full, you take it off, take it over the scales, weigh it up to exactly 100 pounds. There's a shovel there, and there's a barrel that 
you can either get a little more out of them or put some in to make sure you've got exactly 100 pounds in each of those gunny sacks. You sew up the gunny sack. You put it on a dolly till you get three or four stacked there. Then you take the uh, dolly out to the deck outside. There's a boxcar out there, and you stack those gunny sacks up to the top of the of the boxcar there. Now, that's pretty strenuous work. Both of us were champion weightlifters, so uh, that wasn't much of a job. I, it wasn't too much, but what was really the toughest was the air. It was filled with this green dust, and the dust got into your eyes, into your ears, in your nose, in your lungs, and uh, I don't know why in the world they didn't provide uh, some kind of mask for us, but they didn't, and there's supposed to be six men working at that eight hours around the clock on three shifts, and uh, they couldn't keep them there. Guys either quit because they of the work or they quit because they got sick. Pink and I finally, toward the end of that, I think it was about three weeks there, they had only the two of us working around the clock, and we tried to split up the time so that we be just one man doing that and the other one try to get a little rest and food. But that was the most uh, horrendous job that we had in, uh, say, the healthiest. As a matter of fact, Pink, who was so strong, actually got some kind of dust pneumonia or whatever that he, it took him months later to shake. But that was, uh, as I say, uh, the most memorable experience that we had there in the alfalfa mill. Nowadays, they don't have that. They, uh, we went back 37 years later to that site, and then the mill had been torn down. We noticed uh, several miles from there there was another mill, but they make the tablets. They make the alfalfa feed now into tablets without all that dust in the air. We're going to take a quick break for you, words from our sponsors. Yeah, so you and Pink end up in Kansas City. What did you do for work there? Kansas City... We had originally, by the time we finished our work at the uh, alfalfa mill, we saw it was too late to go up to Canada uh, and build a cabin out in the wilderness, that the snows would set in before we could really get all that done. So we decided we'd go back to, we'd go to Kansas City and uh, see if we could, you know, get some jobs there until the next spring when the weather warmed up, then we'd go back to uh, do our odyssey going up to Canada. And uh, uh, Pink, uh, had he'd been a farm boy, and he'd gone into the Army when he was 17. He'd never really had a job in the city. So he had some problems getting a job in Kansas City. Uh, I was okay. I was lucky in that during the war, I had worked the Boy Scout counter at Tide Gettinger, this big department store in Dallas. So I managed to get a job at Peck's department store in Kansas City selling luggage and men's accessories, which was okay, except that I didn't get but about $20 a week after taxes. And after we'd been there a couple or more weeks, uh, Pink hadn't been able to get a job. I said, look, buddy, we can't get by on what I'm making here and not pay the rent here at the YMCA, and also feed ourselves. So we looked at the Sunday edition of the Kansas City Star, and we saw an ad in there that said, uh, salesman wanted, working conditions uh, very good, and uh, pay is, is fine, et cetera, et cetera, and, and put the address of the place for us to uh, apply, and uh, it turned out the uh, that the address was the same address as the famous Folly Theater in Kansas City, uh, which has now been restored, by the way, as a historic landmark. I mean, it had been a site for famous uh, comedians like the Marx Brothers, Bob Hope, uh, Jack Johnson, and Jack Dempsey had put on exhibitions there. Frank James, uh, the brother of Jesse, I had been a ticket collector or something at the Folly Theater in its history. Now, by the time we went there, it was on the skids. It was just the burlesque theater. wasn't nearly as fancy as it had been back in the 20s and 30s. But we, 
we interviewed for the job, and the man said, well, you're going to be selling some stuff during intermissions here between the uh, the uh, burlesque uh, acts and what have you. And you've got, uh, you've got cold drinks to sell for 15 cents, and you sell some candy that we've got here for 25 cents a box, and uh, you also can sell this literature that we distribute for 25 cents a copy. Well, the literature, as you can imagine, was not the kind that you usually got on the newsstand back in those days. It was, uh, I think, pretty tame compared to what's out there now, uh, very openly, but back then it was it was kind of forbidden stuff. I can remember uh, the salesman, we'd go up and down the aisles selling this stuff between the uh, shows, and we, we would alternate on who sold the... Uh, cold drinks and who sold the candy and who sold the uh, magazines. And so I developed a spell <laughs> when, I was, when it was my turn to sell the magazines. And I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when, when you get this little magazine, you let your conscience be your guide. And then I'd say in a lower voice, if you don't have a conscience, you won't need a guide. And I got down to the front, and I turned around and looked up. Pink was selling cold drinks up in the balcony. He was bent over the rail of the balcony laughing. When we went up to the uh, room uh, we stayed in between uh, uh, shows or what have you, I said, what the hell were you laughing at? He said, I was wondering what SMU President uh, Humphrey Lee would have thought if he came in here and saw his outstanding senior man selling that that kind of stuff. I said, Pink, I don't think either of us would have said anything at the time. I think we'd have kept it quiet. Anyhow, I got to tell you this, Brett. We we encountered virtually no meanness this whole time. And even in the burlesque show, the stuff that was on the stage, the strippers and what have you, was much tamer than, than when there's open to public on TV and everything else out there today. The man who hired us, uh, when Pink uh, was not, he never did quite recover from that dust that he got at the Alpha Alpha Mill and decided to go back to Texas and get well down there. Then he'd come, on, he'd come back to Kansas City and we'd resume our trip. When he got ready to go back and told uh, Al, the manager, that he had to quit, uh, uh, Al the, himself reached into his pocket and pulled out a $10 bill and gave it to him. Of course, ten dollars meant more back in those days than now. But I'm just saying that uh, throughout this adventure, we encountered people who were really decent and, and caring. Anyhow, so that was that was Kansas City. Now I lucked out later on after Pink left. I I think I've told you I said something in the book about uh, my brief career in the ring. May we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, talk about your prize fighting career. I'd been working for Peck's department store, only getting about $20 a month, but I managed to save up enough. Finally, there was a lovely young woman working in uh, ladies' lingerie there at Peck's, and so I saved up enough to take her out on a date. Uh, so I, we went to see the, um, after having Cokes and what have you at the drugstore when we got off work, we went to see the movie Champion would just come out. Champion with Kirk Douglas. It's a great movie. I think it's probably the best movie he ever made. Anyhow, uh, if you know much about it, he's he's a boxer there who becomes world champion, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into the plot for you, but a terrific movie. And we're coming out of the movie, and, and my date named uh, Mary, she said, you know, Earl, you look kind of like Kirk Douglas. <laughs> so, you know... <clears throat> As my mom used to tell me, I was full of it back in those days, full of myself. And uh, I decided, well, shoot, maybe I I can uh, do a little boxing myself. And they had a boxing team at the Y, and I trained up there. Finally, uh, my coach, Jules Snyder, said, uh, you know, uh, 
you might like to uh, uh, might, might like me to enter you in uh, one of the bouts next Tuesday. Now, back in those days, I don't know how it is now, but in those days, Kansas City was was big on amateur boxing. Every Tuesday night in the Coliseum, the main auditorium downtown, they'd have these amateur fights, about half a dozen of them, amateurs. Now, I've got to tell you, they weren't strictly amateurs because uh, under the cover, they paid you 10 bucks to fight up there. So I could claim a brief career as a semi-pro if I wanted to. The first fight, I was matched up against a young fellow that had very little more experience than I did, and I won the fight, and, boy, I was so proud of myself. So Jules Snyder, the coach, says, Earl, you, you, you've got a, a natural straight left. He says, uh, you're going to do well. I'm going to put you in the ring with... Uh, uh, Billy here. Billy was a kid who'd had about 27, 28 fights. Well, I thought, you know, he's a fancy Dan, but I might get lucky and win this fight too. Turned out that I didn't get lucky, and he beat the hell out of me. And uh, I was a mess when I... I didn't realize it at the time because my adrenaline was flowing, but when I got down afterwards looked at myself in the mirror, I was shocked. Uh, I mean, my... My right eye, he had thumbed me in the right eye, and it was swollen shut. And my right ear was uh, swelling and blue. The whole side of my right face was turning blue, and I chipped a tooth and what have you. Uh, wasn't wearing a mouthpiece back then because I thought it was strictly for fun. It occurred to me, you know, this is not fun at all. These guys are out to hurt me. I better stick to weightlifting. But I couldn't get... I, by the way, I didn't mention I'd quit my job at uh, Peck's just the day before because I'd gone in and asked the woman for a raise. She said, well, you're not ready for it yet. And I, again, I was uh, that hit my ego, so I said, well, you can have the job. I figured I'd get another job easy enough. But looking the way I did after that fight, it wasn't easy. I went around to several places, and, and I explained I was a member of the YMCA boxing team, and they would say, well, you know, that's a great sport, and we respect that, and we'll call you when we have an opening. After about a week of that, I realized they weren't going to call at all. I lucked out, Brett, when I saw this ad in the Kansas City Star, uh, Armour's Meatpacking Plant across the river over there, and uh, was looking for somebody, were looking for help. And by golly, they didn't care how I looked. They hired me to work on the, on the ham line, trimming hams there. And... Uh, it was a lifesaver for me. Otherwise, I'm not sure how to got by much longer without uh, without a job up there. So that was my brief uh, career as a as a prize fighter, and I've never regret leaving it. We know now how much damage uh, the blows to the head do, and I'll tell you this: for a week after that second fight, uh, my head ached. So I knew that that wasn't the best thing in the world for me. So you didn't make it to Canada. Did you think the trip was a failure? I never, I, I hope I'm answering this correctly. Let me let me tell you that uh, although we didn't make it, uh, this was, uh, uh, I call this, let me put it this way. I call this a happy failure. <laughs> the two of us had no idea about what those dark frozen months of winter would be like up in the Canadian wilderness. The good Lord was with us in not letting us get up there. I'm not sure what would happen. Even so, I say it was a happy failure because it was really a life-changing adventure for me. It not only provided me with a true glimpse of, of American decency and wholesomeness, but it also proved to me that I could get by on my own without necessarily having to depend on family and friends. That's when I was up there in Kansas City by myself after Pink had gone back to East Texas. So I, I, it was a wonderful adventure, and I'll talk a little bit more about it maybe when when uh, we wrap this thing up, if you like. Sure. Your road trip adventure went on about the same time Jack Kerouac was going on his that inspired on the road. How would you say your road trip was different from Kerouac's? That's a great question, uh, uh, Brett. It hits right to the heart of things because Kerouac was on the road at virtually the same time 
that Pink and I were on the road. But his vision of America in his book, his famous book, was very, very different from ours. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it more cynical or whatever, but it's, it's interesting to me. One of the reasons I wanted to publish the far music, Pink's manuscript, and what I'd done with it was to show uh, that uh, there was a different side to America back in the late 40s than the one that Jack Kerouac presents. His book, I mean, it's a great book. I don't want to denigrate it in any way, but it was more relevant to the 60s and the beat generation than, than to mine. I mean, the kind of stuff that he encountered, uh, we did not find at all. Uh, for one thing, he was in a different part of the country, and most of the time, going from east to California, uh, I think he missed the true heart of America in states like Oklahoma and east and west Texas, Kansas, and South Dakota. He missed, by and large, the kind of people we encountered. This is, a, I think this is worth pointing out. Not once in all those adventures that we had, and we were with, in some tough places, not once did we encounter drugs. Now, this is also a different in time. Uh, we went back to uh, retrace some of the itinerary 37 years later. i got to tell you this. And we went back to the site of the alfalfa mill out west of Larned, Kansas. Now, they had torn down the uh, mill itself. Uh, we were out there. I was taking pictures, and some guy in a pickup comes rolling across the field, gets out and says, what are you fellas doing here? And I explained, we explained that we had worked there uh, at a particular time. We were just coming back, kind of, you know, refresh our memories, take some photographs. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, I thought you were out here making a pickup. This has become a drug drop. In other words, Brett, out in the middle of the prairies in western Kansas during that period of time, note the transformation from what we'd encounter and the uh, what came later on after the 60s and what uh, Also, I think, back to Jack Kerouac, all credit due to him, he missed the kind of uh, men that we worked with so much, worked with their hands in the fields and on the farms and what have you. But uh, the kind of guys that Emerson calls... Uh, they had what Emerson calls simplicity of character. Uh, I doesn't mean simplicity of mind, but these guys had a kind of intelligence and common sense and integrity that is special to men that work close to the earth, I think. And as a result, I, I developed a deep and, res and an abiding respect for both the men and the women that make life so much easier for the rest of us uh, and the one of those of us who take so many of our basic necessities as well as our modern day luxuries for granted. Anyhow, uh, I think I hope that answers my your question about Jack Kerouac. How did this trip influence the rest of your life? Well, I call it a life uh, life uh, changing experience for me. Uh, the, of course, the world has changed so much since then. I, uh, I've not been the same since then. I felt that I came of age, in fact, uh, quite literally. I, I was 21 years old, and as I said a little bit earlier in our discussion here, I, I found a part of the world that has, uh, I think, made an influence, made a terrific influence on me, a very different kind of world than the academic world or even the business world or what have you. And uh, it just, uh, it's something, I said at one point, uh, the, those musical notes from the far music have become uh, a part of me forever since that adventure. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Did it influence your, your career to become a Jack London scholar? Uh, yes and no. I mean, mainly no, I think, Brett, in that uh, uh, I hadn't really... Got, uh, I hadn't got really involved in Jack London until I was in the Navy later on and read that same book that influenced Pink Lindsay. He's the one that told me to read Martin Eden. I was on a weekend pass from uh, 
U.S. Naval Training Center in Bainbridge, Maryland. Up in, I was up in Manhattan and browsing the newsstand and saw a paperback edition of Martin Eve, and I said, well, i got to check this out. This is something that my buddy Pink uh, uh, said I had to read. Of course, at the time, he told me that when I was in college, I had other interests mainly extracurricular. Anyhow, I bought a 25-cent copy of Martin Eden and started reading it on the bus back to the base. I got back to the base, and I was so caught up in it, I turned on my flashlight and finished reading it that night in my bunk. And that's what really determined me. If I ever went back to get a doctorate, I was going to do my work on Jack London, and that was the defining thing. Maybe in a deeper sense, unconsciously, that trip influenced me because of the... uh, fact that London uh, had been such an adventurer. He was uh, what I, and if you give me a, uh, let me plug my biography, he's what we uh, we call a seeker. He was he was motivated by that uh, deep uh, seeking drive within us that is along there with the drives for food and sex and, and what have you. Do you think it's possible for young people to go on an adventure like yours? today uh it's possible i think maybe but much more difficult for example i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't want to see my sons as young guys out on the road hitchhiking with all the craziness and the drugs and what have you out there um i mentioned the deal in and learning the alfalfa field out there and what have you uh i think you know uh it's possible nowadays for young guys to have adventures, uh, and I think that if they can get out there, uh, I've got a grandson that, who who climbs mountains, for example, out in Colorado. He has he's uh, I think done some traveling, but most of it's been in the car. I think, as I say, it's possible. It's just uh, it's not as easy now. The jobs, for example, that we were able to get out there. I don't think that they're as readily as available as they were 70 years ago. Do you have any parting words of advice for young men listening to this show based on your experience with the far music? Uh, bear with me. I, I may This may sound a little bit like a sermon or something, but uh, it may, I don't want it to sound like a bunch of cliches, but I talked about that seeking drive that we have. There are all kinds of adventures, uh, not just physical, but intellectual and spiritual. I don't think we, uh, we should ever give up on that, on that kind of seeking and adventuring. Of course, after you get married and have a family, you've got to kind of modify the kind of adventuring you're going to do. But it's still possible to say not only... Uh, physical, but but uh, intellectual and uh, adventures of the mind and spirit, I would say. Even Jack London, toward the end of his career, discovered the, the works of uh, Carl Jung and told his wife, I'm standing on the edge of a world so new and wonderful and terrible, I'm almost afraid to look over into it. So uh, he was still seeking there toward the end of his life. I, if, I had a, if I had to give some... Uh, uh, advice, and as I say again, bear with me if it sounds too much like a sermon, I'd say, look, the guys out there, look, guys, you're a vital part of the magic chain of humanity. You're blessed with a, a unique identity, special gift, uh, and I make a, the most of this wonderful adventure we call life. And I want to, I want to emphasize, celebrate your manhood. Resist all the current socio-political pressures to deprive you of your unique identity as a man. Uh, this is your own special God-given gift, and I'm, I'm saying celebrate it while you can. Well, Earl, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And it's been a great experience for me, and I appreciate you, Brett. My guest today was Earl Labor. He's the author of the book, The Far Music. It's available on Amazon.com. Also check out his biography on Jack London. It's called Jack London, A Life. Great biography if you're interested in that guy. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash farmusic, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.